Okay. I'd like to welcome everyone out to our Shaper uh, Network call today. Welcome our Shaper Network members and other invite us, invited guests to the call. This is our weekly Shaper Network virtual call. The Shaper Network is a support and mastermind community for architecture firm owners to help you amplify your purpose, passion, and profit as business owners, architects, and design professionals. Other guests here on the line today include current business of architecture clients, including those in our executive mentoring program. So welcome everyone who's uh, attending today. We're, we're really glad to have you here. Now, just by way of housekeeping, this is new format for the Shaper Network call, which will now be held every Monday at this time. And today we have, as we announced via email, a special guest, Patrick McLamey, FAIA, who I will introduce in a minute after I go over the format of today's call. The format of today's call will be as follows. Ryan Willard, Business of Architecture's Director of Business Transformation, will conduct an interview with Mr. McLamey. And the first half of our call will be devoted to that live podcast interview. So you get to sit here and listen in as uh, Ryan conducts that call. It should be pretty fun. And uh, the first, as I mentioned, that'll be the first half. We project that to be about 25 to 30 minutes. Uh, if any questions come up for you during that time period, um, just go ahead and put those in the in the chat box, and I'll relay those, relay those to Ryan, and we'll we'll ask those questions to Mr. McLamey. Now, after the question and answers, um, so pardon me. After the podcast, uh, the live podcast interview will be followed by 15 to 20 minutes of of live audience questions. So, after so during the let me back up a second. So after the question and answer session, we'll split you up into breakout groups and share your top takeaways for 15 minutes, after which we'll come back here into the main meeting and further details will be given at that time. So please keep your video on for the duration of today's meeting, uh, but keep your sound muted so we can avoid interruptions, any dogs, dogs barking, you know, babies crying in the background. Motorbikes, uh, fire engines. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Fire, <laughs> kids doing homeschool, things like that. Um, because it is it is a live recording, live broadcast. Now, again, as I mentioned, over the next 30 minutes, please think about the questions that you might have for Patrick McLamey, and feel free to put those into the chat box, because I will be taking and uh, letting you unmute your line so you can be part of the conversation, but it's important that we don't talk over each other with a group meeting like this. So with that, um, I'm going to now introduce our, our guest. Patrick McLamey is our guest today. Welcome, Patrick. Thank you. It's great to be here. Patrick McLamey just released a, a book on his experience in leadership and business through his time at HOK, leading there, titled Designing a World-Class Architecture Firm, The People, Stories, and Strategies Behind HOK. McLamey is also the chairman of Building Smart International, which, Patrick, you told me that you're working on another book that's going to focus on your work with that organization and that, that project as well. Yes, indeed. I'm looking forward to that. That's just beginning. Okay. Wow. <clears throat> I mean, yeah, I think after 50 years of, 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 you know, being in the firm and 13 years of leading it, you know, you take some time off, but I can tell you're, you're a man who doesn't slow down. I, I'm repurposed. I'm not retired. There we go. Thank you. Thank you. Repurposed. I love <laughs> that. Now, Building Smart International works to achieve open standards for the exchange of digital information, which we know with the plethora of digi different digital tools out there drawing standards is hugely important uh, to our industry. He was a founding member of Building Smart in 1994. Uh, he spent 50 years at HOK, which grew into one of the largest architecture and engineering firms uh, in the world during his time there. Uh, McLamey rose from junior designer to CEO of HOK and witnessed the firm's growth from a single Midwestern office to 27 locations across the globe, uh, offering architecture, interiors, engineering, planning, and more. McLamey joined HOK, for those of you that did the math, in 1967, after which he helped establish the firm's San Francisco outpost in 1970, later becoming managing principal of that office. He joined HOK's executive committee in 1995, and was named the COO five years later. In 2003, HOK shareholders elected McLamey as chief executive officer, and he led the firm for 13 years in that position. In 2016, McLamey chose a new CEO for HOK, remaining as chairman for one more year before retiring, or in his, in his words, 
repurposing, repurposing. repurposing. So Patrick, welcome it again. It's, it's a, we're excited. I'm excited to have you on the call and we haven't tried this format before the live podcast interview, but we're excited to move ahead and Ryan will be conducting the interview. So I'll go ahead and turn the time over to Ryan Willard and perhaps interject occasionally. Thank Brilliant. you. Thank, thank you so much, Enoch. And a pleasure to be speaking with you, Patrick. Um, an absolutely extraordinary career. And I suppose as well, you know, it's kind of 50 years of in the same practice as well, which gives a yeah. tremendous amount of depth and understanding to, to not only the projects that you've worked on, but also the architecture of the business and of HOK, which is, which is you know, and, and a tremendous amount of insight. And I suppose the first question really for you is, is what, what makes a successful practice? How, how do you take it from what was happening in 1955 to the behemoth that is today? Yes. Uh, that's, of course, the, the very good first question. And I, I would tell you, first of all, I'm, I am the one that's honored to be speaking to everybody that's in this webinar. Um, many of you were born after I actually began my practice at HOK. I understand that. And um, I, was, uh, I was trained classically or traditionally before the computer, before the internet, uh, before we knew how to do Zoom meetings and all of that. And um, uh, I joined HOK right out of graduate school, not knowing uh, that I would stay there the rest of my career, but thinking instead, uh, the firm was founded in St. Louis, Missouri, for those who don't know, is in the center of the US, um, an unlikely place for a world-class firm to begin. And uh, what I learned after being there for a while is it was an extraordinary firm because of the strategy of the three founders. And they are the ones that had the vision to start HOK on this journey. All of them, you know, we think we have a crisis now with this coronavirus pandemic and hopefully now we'll all be getting the vaccine in the next few months and it will be behind us. But they were all, uh, touched by or affected directly by two major events. The Great Depression, which was not six or nine months long like the coronavirus, but a decade of the 1930s, and also by World War II. Um, George Helmuth, the founder, the H, and here's the cover of the book. George Helmuth is the guy that's peeking out from behind the H. I wrote the book, but I didn't design the cover, but I do love this cover image. George Helmuth was the son of an architect and his father and his father's brother practiced architecture in the turn of the 1900s in St. Louis, a firm naturally enough called Helmuth and Helmuth. And they did uh, some fairly distinguished work, but he watched his father and his uncle struggle with a boom and bust cycle. Get a project, hire some draftsmen, and that's what it was in those days. Uh, find, uh, begin, to, begin to get a, a real firm going when they got the draftsmen trained, how to do the work properly and how to collaborate with each other. And just about the time they had a more effective operation, the project would be finished. And unless they had something to replace the project, they would lay off all their draftsmen and start over again, be down to the two brothers. And young George Helmuth, our founder, grew up in this environment and he called it a roller coaster, up and down, up and down, where he saw his father and his uncle struggle with good times and lean times. And the firm never really, uh, even though they did some good work, the firm actually never was built anything for itself. Um, by the time his father and his uncle were ready to retire, the firm had no value. And both, uh, both men, both his father and his uncle, went into retirement, not as poor people, but as people that didn't have much to show for an entire career practicing architecture. And you are all in that stage, at some point in that, in that stage, how in the heck can I make this work and, and how can I build something, not just live day by day, like Helmut's father and his uncle. So he put together 
It's a long story, I won't bore you. He put together some principles. Uh, he was a natural, George Helmuth, the, the, our founder, was a natural salesperson. And he put together some principles for what he called, and again, he grew up in, 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 the, in the 20s, graduated from college, from university in 1930, just when the Great Depression began. He couldn't get a job as an architect. His father and his uncle couldn't hire him. It was a searing experience for him. So he finally got a job in another city, Detroit, working for a firm, Smith Henchman at Grills, who had work because the auto industry was growing. And Smith Henchman at Grills was busy designing assembly plants and other buildings for Ford and General Motors and Chrysler. And um, while he was there, he developed uh, some principles for how do you make what he called a depression-proof firm, one that doesn't go up and down, up and down all the time. And there are four of them, and they're pretty simple ideas. The first one is that people are the single biggest resource in a firm. So if you hire an employee, uh, even if it's your brother or your sister or close family member or anyone else, they become resources to help you put your firm forward. And the last thing he wanted to do once he brought in the right people was see them uh, have to leave again because there wasn't work. So people were the key, attracting what he called attracting and keeping good people was the number one principle. Well, now, how do you do that? The second principle, um, you do it with full-time marketing or business development. He said, clients uh, don't grow on trees. I'm sure all of you know that. Clients need to be cultivated. He called it, uh, they need to be cultivated almost like a farmer cultivates his crops. First, you have to till the soil and then plant the seeds. And then you have to tend the, the fields, keep the weeds out and so on, and give them water. And only after that's all finished, you've done all that prep work, can you actually harvest the results? And most food crops take a year to grow. I guess uh, fruit orchards and others take longer. But he said a typical, a typical client uh, that you want to cultivate to become your friend and and the one that thinks of your firm first needs about five years to be properly cultivated. It's not an instant process, and you can't you can't take shortcuts. And you have to be sincerely interested in your clients. He always told me, and I, I'm, I knew all three founders really well. Helmuth always told me, if you're not sincerely interested in your client, they know it. And they will not pay attention to you when their next project comes along. And by being sincerely interested, he gave me an example. He said, you know, most architects, when they come to an interview with a client, spend a lot of the time in the interview talking about themselves and their work. And he said, if they didn't know something about you and your work before, uh, they probably wouldn't have put you on the list to be interviewed. And what he worked on, uh, drilled into us as young architects is, during the interview, you have to be, you have to engage with your client. They're there not to be entertained, but to have a dialogue. So the HOK interview style was, to take a very little amount of time to just summarize who we are, introduce ourselves, and then spend the rest of the time engaging with the client. What is it you need? How big do you want to build it? You know, what are the issues that you see? Do you have a clear idea about this and that and so on? If you're sincerely interested, the client knows of that interest. So full-time marketing was the second principle. The third principle, was uh, diversity. And I'm not talking about gender diversity or racial diversity, although that's fine too. I'm talking about building type diversity. When Helma started HOK in 1955, the whole uh, United States and many countries around the world, if the post-war years, there was a baby boom after World War II and all the architects were busy designing schools. And at first, at least for those who were in the US, it was grade schools, 
primary education. And then as the children were growing up, pretty soon there was work on junior high schools and then high schools. And then when I joined the firm in 1967, HOK was doing a lot of university work following that baby boom along. Helmuth was smart and he saw that the baby boom wouldn't go forever. Mm. The baby boom finally ran its course and then there, were no, there was not so much need for schools. So during that time, that, that decade, when the firm was feasting on school work, first grade schools and high schools and universities, what did Helmuth do? He was a full-time marketer and he looked, he looked at that time as prime opportunity to cultivate clients in other building types. He found a, a project to do a, 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 a new airport in St. Louis, the city he was from, that got HOK into the aviation business. He badgered the State Department of the United States until he finally got a little embassy project uh, in the Caribbean. And that led to a lot of embassy work over the years. He was able to find a prison project to design. And let me just say, for those who don't think that prisons are glamorous work, he says every project, every project is a design opportunity, no matter what it is, because buildings are for people, including prisons. There are people there. And uh, so don't turn down the work because it doesn't fit your, your style or your, your wishes. Every, every project is an opportunity and every opportunity to do a good job with designing for your clients is an opportunity to expand your practice. So diversity, not only building type diversity, <clears throat> Helmuth also believed that, that um, diversity should extend to geography as well. And this was, again, before the internet, uh, HOK was one of the, he, Helmuth, was one of the pioneers of using air travel to set up contacts with clients in other cities besides St. Louis where the firm was started. Mm. And uh, in those early days, he actually impressed clients just by showing up in their office, a plane ride away from St. Louis. These days that's not so uh, new, but it was an extraordinary thing then. And Helmuth believed that HOK should have not just one office, but a network. Why? Because it's be nice, no. He said, if you have a, an office, a new office, and the, the, next, the first office that was established outside of St. Louis happened to be San Francisco, where I live today, and I was sent there in 1970. Uh, he said, if, the, if St. Louis, if the economy is slow in St. Louis, maybe there will be enough work in San Francisco to help keep the St. Louis staff busy. Again, going back to that first overarching principle, you want to attract and keep people for the long term so that they can grow up in your firm and become ever more valuable to you. So that's the third principle is diversity. And he eventually extended the idea of diversity, not only to building types and, and locations. And I think when I left HOK I had 27 locations around the world, but also service type. Helma said, Every client doesn't always need the architect. Sometimes they need an interior designer or they need some engineering help or they need a programmer or they need some landscape architecture or planning work done. Um, he said, we should know how to provide every kind of design related service. Uh, and that, that is continuing to this day and the firm has continued to follow that mission of developing uh, uh, experience and capability in in the details of what people need, including now, for example, HOK does a lot of sustainability consulting because why? Because our clients need this and it's a way to stay connected to those clients. Hmm. So the fourth and last principle for Helmuth was this. He watched his father and his uncle in his firm. And if, if this rings a bell with any of you, I, I, I hope that if you hear nothing else today, you hear this. Firms that become partnerships, partnerships between two architects, let's say, typically work this way. The partners share the staff, they share the office space and the, and the computers and, the, and, um, and the, the resources of the office. 
But if one partner gets a client and wins a project, that partner gets to be the designer and the other one has to help. And if the other partner gets a job, then it becomes his or her project and the other one gets to help. Father, Helmuth watched his father and his uncle fight over this. I want to design that building. No, you, I got that project. That's my client. He saw that conflict between two architects, brothers, uh, who who uh, were always in conflict about who was going to take the responsibility, who got to design the next job. And Helma said, the the best way to organize a firm is to is to is to design it so that you have a really top design person who has this great talent. The design person is the lead for design for the firm. The marketing person that's got great talent for marketing is the lead marketer. And he picked one other partner, George Kassebaum, who was, who was particularly gifted and a very organized man. I knew him well as what was called in those days, the principle for production. Now it would be project architecture or technical architecture. So he separated out the responsibilities of each partner by uh, giving each an assignment. It didn't mean it did not mean that Obata was not involved. That's the, the market, the designer, the O, he Obata. He was involved in marketing too. So it was George Kassebaum, the production man. They were all involved in everything, but each one had a leadership role. So if George Helmuth decided the building ought to be purple, but Gio said, no, I think it should be green, the building was green. If you follow what I mean, that's an important consideration. But the overarching one is attract and then keep good people. There were some other innovations that, um, so when I joined the firm, it was still one office, but they had already grown to 150 people 12 years after the firm started. And three years later, I was in San Francisco. I had never been west of Denver. I did not know how San Francisco was such a beautiful place. Um, and uh, I fell in love with it and I'm here today, uh, 47 years later after I moved here. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, having, this, having this opportunity for young people to grow up, and I'm the poster child for it, 50 years, starting as a junior designer, getting transferred, eventually making a switch from design to my natural uh, ability was management eventually becoming the managing principal in the San Francisco office and then on and on. So uh, how was, how did, um, how did you find your, your natural expertise? Uh, I will tell you that I was told what it was. Uh, my bosses at the time in San Francisco sat me down one day. I'd been designing. I've, I've, I've designed a number of buildings in San Francisco that have my name on them. Mm. I have HOK's name on, but I was the designer. And I would say I was a pretty good designer, but uh, it was very clear that when I was on a project team and I was the designer, I also seemed to want to organize the team and make sure that we met the deadlines. And I had an eye on the budget to make sure we didn't over overspend on our budget and so on. So finally, um, the bosses pulled me aside and said, you know, Patrick, you're at that place where you, you you, you've been a good designer, and if you want to remain a designer, you can you can continue. However, you show great promise in this management side, and if you wish, you could take that. You're a fork. You can take that route and become a manager. And um, we're just sure that you would do very very well at that, and maybe have more success with that than in the design. So they didn't make me do it; they offered it, right. and I thought about it for a while talked to my wife and uh, finally said, yes, I think I would like that. And that led me in a whole new, opened up a whole world for me that I did not imagine was possible. Has there, has there been um, it, periods in, in your career when the business hasn't been operating as smoothly as you would have wanted it to? And how did oh, you weather yeah. How did you weather those sorts of storms? That's it's in the book. Uh, the firm, uh, 
the firm beginning, the firm grew so explosively in the 80s, in the 70s and 80s. By the 90s, uh, we were spread around the world. And uh, no one in the leadership of the firm had until that time given a lot of thought to, well, how do you scale up a firm? How do you make a practice that started as one office with these three great dynamic leaders? How do you make, how do you duplicate that all over the world? And then how do you knit it all together? So by the mid nineties, late nineties, we had the usual growing pains, I think of many firms, offices that didn't want to share the work with the other offices. People right. were openly competing with each other for the same clients. Um, offices that were practicing, I'm going to say sloppy business practices, like not collecting the fees that were due them and expecting that the firm would somehow take care of it. Um, uh, just before I was made the CEO, uh, that really boiled into a crisis for the for HOK. Uh, uh, I, I, I was called by our banker. And uh, by the way, if you don't have a bank, folks, if you don't have a line of credit, as you grow, you're going to need one. It's, uh, it's like, think of it like a great big credit card. It's a good thing to have if you need it, but keep it in your wallet most of the time. So we had a, a line of credit with, a, with our bank and it started under with the founders, a local bank in St. Louis, Missouri. Boatman's Bank. And Boatman's Bank had over the years been consolidated and merged until finally our bank was Bank of America. And uh, I was called to Bank of America when I was a COO. And uh, so the, our, our, uh, the, the, our CFO and I went to the bank and I met a man half my age who just berated me up and down about I don't know what you're doing over there in HOK, but you're used, you've used up all your line of credit, which was in the millions. You're maxed out on your line. And uh, you know, when a bank gives uh, you or anybody else a loan, they always attach strings. And the strings, the polite term for those is bank covenants. You have to, you have to fit certain criteria in order to be credit worthy, in order to be able to borrow the money. We were in violation of eight of them, all eight out of eight. And so I got a tongue lashing by this young man. He wasn't interested in what I was going to do about it. He just wanted to vent to me. And uh, after the meeting was finished, uh, I said, you know, he said, when are you going to start paying us back? And I said, we're going to start paying you back within a few months as soon as, as soon as our cash flow improves. And once we do, we will make payments every month until every penny is paid off. He didn't believe me but I never wanted to see him again. And in fact, I never did, but we began to improve our cash flow mm. and collect money from clients and turn around offices that were failing, which is another whole story. And uh, after a couple of months started by making our first payment or two, and every month or two, we would make an additional payment. Then the banker got very chummy. He said, well, um, would you like a bigger line of credit? No, we just want to pay it off. Finally, the day came when we paid the, the line of credit back down to zero. And the banker invited the CFO and me to a nice big lunch. And I said, I don't want to go. I want you to find a new bank. Because the banker didn't treat me as a customer. He treated mm -hmm. me as, as um, some kind of whipping boy. So the banker didn't treat me like a customer, just like Sometimes architects don't treat their clients like customers, which is what they are. Yeah. So we changed banks. And uh, I never saw that young banker again. Uh, the other thing we did is we, and this is important for any of you young architects, we didn't just pay off the line of credit to zero. When we got our new banking relationship, we got a new line of credit. We also began to make deposits into that bank. In, until we had built up what we call our strategic cash reserve. And I won't tell you how much it was, but it's, it's been growing over the years. It's in the millions. And we use it for opportunities. When we needed new computers, that's where the money was, was found. When we found a firm that we could merge with that cost some money, that's where the money was. So if you're not doing this 
if you're not managing your cash, you're not actually leveraging your position as a firm. And uh, that's a lesson that I wasn't taught in architecture school. I'm sure nobody was taught that. You have to learn that the hard way by learning it at a school of hard knocks. Absolutely. Um, but just one, one last question from myself before we go on to the, yep. the groups. We've got some great questions coming in here. Um, for you, what's the difference between managing and leading? Oh, what an excellent question that is. You know, um, when I was a young architect, before I became a project manager, that was my first step in the management. It was called, the term is project manager. I think around the world, people that organize and run projects are called that. Mm. And I had this bad idea that project manager was somebody who sat behind a desk or in a little office and told people what to do. That I would make out a schedule and say, okay, Joe, you do this and Sally, you do that. And what I quickly learned was that that's not, that's managing, that's not leading. And leading is a different, if you're not leading as a manager, you're not actually managing anything. Uh, people need leaders, not managers. There are a few things that a manager does like develop a schedule or a budget for the work. That's okay, that's a management job. Dealing with people is a leadership job. Right. People do not work well when you tell them what to do. And I'll draw straight lines and draw, you know, people work well when you sit with them or stand with them, get out of your office or cubicle, work with them, your, your team or an individual, and listen to them. How are you doing? How are you working on that such a part of the project? Is there anything that, that's holding you up? Yeah. Ask a lot of questions and let them find their way to the solutions, even if you know the answer already of what they should do. It takes patience, which is something I had to learn. But once you have that, that once you have that spirit and in, in inculcated in that person, that person will become uh, a giant. They'll become self-realized. They'll actually, uh, the most wonderful experiences I've had as a leader are when I find that people who are uh, not just waiting to take an order to see what I, I want them to do, but thinking about projects themselves. Right. Uh, leaders do that. And it's an art, it's not a science, and it's definitely not management. In fact, at HOK, you know, we have managing principal, project manager, and so on. I said, why don't we just get rid of all the management jobs and call them leadership jobs? We tried that for a while, but we found that we were swimming uphill, that the whole world knows about what a project manager is, but nobody knew what a project leader was. So we still have project managers, but if they're not leading, they're not managing. And how do you, how do you train your leadership? Um, or how do, you, how do you imbue leadership onto uh, or create other leaders? Yes, uh, I think it's more of a mentoring job than a training job. Um, mentoring means you let people find their own way. You even let them make their own mistakes. Uh, the biggest key to leadership, I think, is having the patience to work with somebody, to suggest some directions and so on, but not tell them everything. Mm -hmm. Let them find their own way because once they find it, the light bulb goes on and then you have somebody that's, that's stepped up another level in their own growth. And once they've done that a few times, if they know that the leader is pulling for them, wants them to succeed, um, they, they become um, self-realized. They're on fire. Then they start to suggest things. Maybe we should do this instead of that. And some of the biggest joys I've had are when people exceed, you know, I had an idea about how to solve a problem and somebody came up with something that was much more brilliant because uh, I allowed them to, because they were allowed to think for themselves. Brilliant. I think, I think that's, this is the perfect uh, point in this conversation to, yeah. to go over to some of the great questions that we've been getting from, from the group here. And uh, I'll start off with the question from Ramiro. 
and, and this, I'll, I'll and go this, ahead and I'll, I'll unmute Ramiro's line. So I'll unmute the, the lines, Ryan, as you kind of oh, pick out the, uh, people can just the askers. And Jonathan, you had sent a couple of questions to me. I'll, for, I'll forward those to, uh, to Ryan as well. Great. So Ramiro, do you want, do you want to ask your question? Sure. Um, so I heard from um, business coaches and professional leaders that um, we should specialize, not diversify too much. Now, um, I have a small firm, uh, it's four, four or five people. Right. It want to grow and grow steadily. Um, is diversifying a good thing? Uh, because I heard that you specialize, you could, you know, make more money, you know, you could use yeah. that to grow the company. Or at what point does the diversifying come into play yeah. uh, more seriously? At HOK, it was from the beginning. Uh, it's, it's an interesting thing. You're, you're, you're asking a great question. Let's say you wanted to specialize in schools or green architecture. No, actually, those are different. Let's say you wanted to specialize in schools, which is what was happening when I started the practice. That's okay, as long as the school business is, is, is okay. But if, you, if you're the world's best school architect or, uh, and th there are no more schools to design, you're out of business. So you ought to have two or three building types at least that you know how to do or, and you ought to be working on another one, in my opinion. Uh, if there are enough of a kind of building, you can also, if you have, you have four people in your firm, did you say? Yes. Four, you can begin the process, even with a firm of four, to begin some specialization where people inside your firm say, become your school expert or your, your green expert or your something else expert, where they, you, you, you let them uh, and encourage them to develop their knowledge base and their skill in this particular area. So when you go to a client that needs something green, you have somebody with you that you can sell, that can talk with uh, and ask the right questions about green architecture. And let me just say, schools and green architecture are two different things. The world uh, is always, I think, uh, for the, as long as you all are gonna practice, the world is going to need green architecture, when I, sustainable design. Uh, the world sometimes will need schools and sometimes will not. You see the difference? Mm -hmm. So uh, the other thing you could do is specialize in things that never go out of style. Like I think green architecture is one of those things. Um, the, uh, another one is uh, some kind of interiors work because no matter what's going on in the economy, people are changing the insides of their buildings to suit, uh, including the coronavirus. It's causing companies to change how, they, how they're organized internally. So um, I think you should, if you wanna have a firm that's sustainable, in addition to having steady clients and collect, getting and collecting money and putting some aside, you need to be diverse enough so that you don't paint yourself in the corner by having just one specialty. That's, that's true in nature, you know. Animals that uh, we're, uh, humans are omnivorous. We can eat almost anything. And that's one of the things that, uh, again, I'm an architect, I'm not a, I'm not a, I don't know about evolution so much, but it's one of the reasons we're still around because we know how to eat almost anything in almost any climate. And it's allowed us to survive and prosper and flourish among other things. It, it, it's, a, it's a really really interesting question about diversification. And obviously from yeah. um, a marketing perspective, being, in a, being perceived as a, a, spe a specialist in a particular area means that you've kind of got a bit more expertise. And it's interesting to look at the structure of HOK, for example, with HOK Sport, yeah. Uh, has has that kind of that kind of you've you've remained diversified, but then you've structured the company where you've actually got specialist parts. Yes, in the case of HOK, as we grew very very large, and HOK when I left had about two thousand employees, and uh, it allowed the firm to do something the founders did not um, did not anticipate. As we became more diverse over the years people inside the firm became specialists. So there were people that were just doing sports architecture. And in fact, even within sports, we had specialties in American football, soccer, 
or football as it would be known in the rest of the world, and basketball and hockey and, and so on. So uh, we knew how to design different for different sports venues and specialists within there. We even had one person who was a specialist in turf to kind of grass to plant depending on the climate and the salinity of the soil and so on and so on in different stadiums. So uh, greater diversity in HOK's case with growth also gave the opportunity for some, many of us uh, in the firm, not, not I, many people to become specialists. But just remember, if you're, let's say a healthcare specialist, you still need a roof that won't leak. And you still need a, uh, you still need a, uh, uh, exit stairs and elevators and technical architecture that is pretty consistent among, across all the building types. So you'll need specialists for certain building types, but you'll also need generalists that are good at, the, at what is now known as technical architecture, that know how to make buildings that really work. Yeah. So it's a, it's a juggling act. And if you have a firm of four, and I think the, the average size firm in the USA is about eight, uh, and it was about eight when George Helmuth began the practice. And it was about eight when his father and his grand and his uh, uncle practiced. It's been eight for almost forever. And my own personal opinion is you have a choice, you younger people, to grow or to stay the same. And I think staying the same is possible, but challenging because of the things that I'm saying. Growing some, somewhat, so that you can diversify somewhat and develop, begin to develop specializations inside your firm may be something you'd want to think about or consider. Brilliant. Thank um, you. I've got a, a question here from Anne Hindley. Anne, do you want to? And, and, and by all means, introduce yeah. yourself and a little bit about your, uh, just a sort of a short sentence yeah, about your practice, and then you can answer the okay. ask your question. Uh, so I, um, my practice is in, in Melbourne, Australia. We do high-end residential projects, yeah. uh, and we're a team of three at the moment. Yeah. Uh, so my question was, hang on, let me try to find it. Um, so if uh, I'm a sole director and so I'm doing those three roles all myself that uh, yeah. you described which you know the yeah. designer marketer production yep. so do you think it is better to hire those other two people or to go into business with them you mean go into business oh I see it depends and it's all about people if you have people that you really really like and you worked well together, you collaborated as your firm and somebody else's firm, then it's a bit like a marriage. Uh, mergers can be wonderful things only if, only if the people in each firm share a, a big, broad amount of the same culture and the same, uh, the same values. Uh, HOK has had experience with this, a lot of it, where we've, uh, in some of the early years, some of the, the, the the purchases of other firms that HOK made or mergers were, they were incompatible. We bought a firm in New York City because George Helmuth was in a hurry to get an office there. He said, anybody who's anybody needs an office there. The firm was um, diametrically opposed to almost everything HOK stood for. Um, HOK's philosophy was that the firm in HOK, we want to collaborate inside the firm, collaborate fully like one big family in order to compete better outside the firm. The firm we bought was like a cat fight, everybody climbing over each other inside that one firm, that one office, it was awful. And um, uh, eventually we, we kept that firm because we had paid for it, but the uh, HOK in New York did not actually make much progress until most of those people had found their way to the door. So just be careful who you find as a, as a partner or if you hire someone and groom them, that's probably better, but it takes longer. That's the, that's the, the dilemma. I know it well. <laughs> Brilliant. We've got a few questions here about the strategy behind the your the, the cash reserves 
that HOK yeah. built up and how the and how the business functioned like that. Laurie, do you would you like to ask your question? Hi, Lori Dalba. We're from Dalba Architects in Lockport, New York, which is Western New York, uh -huh. um, focusing primarily on residential, outdoor living areas, and the like, like uh -huh. commercial. But I wondered if the strategic cash reserves that you were talking about actually ended up replacing your line of credit. In other words, were you then able to finance your all of your opportunities internally? Um, uh that's a yes and no. Uh, as the cash reserves, as we build up our cash reserves, and again, I won't tell you the exact numbers, except it was in the millions. The cash reserves eventually exceeded by quite a bit the line of credit. Uh, and we could have, we could have just said, well, we're not going to pay for the line of credit anymore because it costs money. It costs money just to have the bank say, we'll hold some money for you if you need it. But we, we decided that it was not in our best interest. We made a decision that um, uh, in a couple of times, it, it became almost uh, when we had a cash reserve, but we had a major purchase to make, it depleted them quite a bit. So we kept both. But uh, if you get to that happy position where your cash reserves exceed the line of credit, and I would say, um, you know, you have to be careful about this. Um, it's a bit like uh, running your own family business. Uh, how much cash do you need if, if you lost your job tomorrow and there was no more money coming? How long can you live? And uh, how many months? So at HOK, I, uh, instead of zero months, I decided six months was a really good number. Uh, um, and uh, that's what we that's what we shot for. Uh, the the line of credit is not six months worth. It's something less than that. But uh, it depends on the market you're in and how comfortable you are with it. Uh, but having cash is think of it as like stored up energy to do things with your business that otherwise you can't do. Debt and uh, being in debt to a bank or to an investor is uh, another form of uh, it's first cousin, in my mind, it's first cousin of slavery. It, it, it actually is very difficult to run a successful practice if you're, if you're in debt like that. Thank That's you. a great question. There was a, a, another question about the um, cash reserves from Ramiro, um, and he was asking what, what sort of percentage of gross revenue should go into the cash reserves? Right, well, Ramiro, I think I just answered it. Uh, Look at your own personal life. If you if you lost your job tomorrow and there was no money coming in, how long could you how how comfortable would you be with one week's worth of cash or two weeks or a month? Or uh, most people would say, well, gee, if I had cash to to last me a month, maybe in that month I could get a new job. Others, uh, I'm more conservative than that. I said, gee, I need at least three months, ninety days worth of cash. Mm -hmm to survive. And you can play all kinds of uh, little tricks with it because some of the cash you collect is probably for consultants. But remember, those are your friends and colleagues. They need to eat too. So uh, don't, don't neglect them in favor of paying yourself because uh, you'll find if you do that, they won't be your consultants. They won't be loyal to you for very long because they need to eat just like you do. So I, my own view is um, a good, prudent middle ground is, is 90 days worth of cash. If you can build up to that, you're in fairly decent shape. Uh, well, but it's, it's, it depends on the market you're in and yourself. So, so we do mainly commercial and, and sometimes we pick up residential. Uh, but uh, I was asking more like um, on a monthly basis uh, from your gross revenue, how much percentage should you put in there? Um, just one quick example. I read the book Profit First by Mike Michalowicz and We've been practicing like 1%, 2% of every check that comes in. And in a year, that's, you know, about in our firm, it's about 10,000, something like that. Yeah. Um, it helps, you know, it's not a lot of money, but um, that was mainly my question. Like, how do you really reserve that? Like, you know, 1%, 2%, kind of forget about it, you know, put it in a bank account they have you no access to. Well, yeah, that's a- How do you build it in the three months? <laughs> um, you know, if you put that 1% aside, 
how long would it take for you to get 90 days worth of cash for your firm? Three years, maybe? <laughs> yeah, that, that might be a little bit long. Mm -hmm. um, and again, these are special times. There's the coronavirus and so on. But um, the sooner you can do that, that's, I called it winning our freedom. Once we had that accomplished, wow. Uh, there are other ways to do it. You can also get an investor mm. uh, or put your own money in. But if you do that, yeah, you man. owe somebody else the money. So it's better to earn it the old fashioned way and to put some aside, but it takes discipline. And uh, I think the world needs successful architects that know how to run a business, not starving architects that want to design the next great building. You need to be successful to be great designers, in my opinion. It's uh, born over 50 years of experience. We, we share a common value there, Patrick. So yeah. <laughs> that's, that's why we do what we do. We appreciate that. We've got some, uh, um, there's some more great questions here from, uh, from Jonathan. Jonathan, do you want to introduce yourself and ask a question about the principles being applied to solopreneurs? Yeah, hi. Um, my name is Jonathan. This is my second run at having my own firm. I'm in San Antonio. I'm a solopreneur, but I have, at, you know, different times, two to six different contract people working on projects. So um, I had several questions, was trying to figure, because I've worked for a 90 person firm, was trying to figure out how to apply some of the things you were sharing with us. But I guess my specific question would be related to first hires and the importance of them satisfying or, or uh, sorry, first hires and, and the importance of them directing um, the culture that you want to build. Yeah. I've got people available that can do the job, but they wouldn't be the people that would become those future partners and all those types of things. But I'd, I either need to, you know, find somebody or, or build somebody from scratch. Yes. Um, I mean, I, probably the greatest thing that George Helmuth did was he found two partners uh, and they started the firm together. Uh, he was, uh, he was uh, among his other guests, he was a very savvy, gifted man when it came to selecting the right people. Uh, that's probably the most important decision you'll make about your firm. Do you grow your partners or do you, do you merge with your partner? You find them. Uh, do, do, you know, do you marry somebody or do you, do you, do you grow your, your future partners? If you grow them, it takes time. It just does. If you find somebody that you really like to work with um, and uh, you, seem, you seem culturally compatible, and by that, it doesn't mean I just like somebody. Uh, do they have the same attitudes that you have about design or about money or about what the, cult, the culture is inside the firm and so on? If you do those things, you can find people that share your values. Then you've got yourself the makings of a partnership. Again, one of the things that Helma said was, even if the three partners in his case, design uh, management, uh, design uh, marketing and production, even if they're not the same and, um, uh, and so on, each one's responsible for a piece of the business. So it's not as necessary that they all be exactly the same. They should be different, uh, but they need to get along. They need to they need to cooperate like partners, because if you've got that, you it's like a marriage. If you've got that, you've got everything. If you don't have it, it's a disaster. But anyway, good luck with you. Right, thank you. Uh, I should just say that uh, we're almost to one o'clock, and I have uh, a pending uh, other appointment coming up. So. Uh, I hate to do this because this is to me the most fun part of the whole webinar. I, I uh, Enoch and Rian, I and and everybody, I would be happy to come back again sometime if you if you would have me, where there's more time we, to do we, this. We I might guess. do that. Uh, we might have okay. you. Be careful what yeah. Be careful what you ask for, yeah. Patrick. But uh, <laughs> we we understand you do need to hop off, so feel free to just to jump off now. We don't want to hold you back in terms of getting on your other call. Um, you know, forgive us if we've been, uh, you know, so hungry, but we are hungry and we would, we would love the opportunity to get more information and just to interact with you more in the future. So thank you. Yeah. Everyone, let's give them a, a big wave goodbye. And just as a token of gratitude for spending your time with us today, we really thank appreciate you. I, it. I loved every minute of it and uh, I'd be happy to come back again if you, if you wish. 
So okay. Thank thanks you for having me. Okay. Yep. And everybody, bye -bye. best of luck. Yep. Thank you. Bye for now. Bye bye. Thank you, Patrick. Bye bye.